we always feel uh, entrepreneurs have a lot of questions. They just want also words of advice. Access becomes a problem. I know that uh, people like Naveen are busy, but they also truly genuinely want to give back to the ecosystem. Making those two things happen is hard. Listening to them on the stage is one thing, but each of you want to ask something personal. We know that. So we ran a Twitter contest. Oh, you. And we had lots of applicants. Because we want this to be very intimate, so that it's not a large crowd, we only selected a few people. So they have a chance to ask you directly. Um, so this session is about Naveen and you. It's not about me asking him questions. But what I do have here is the questions you have asked. So I'll just read out the question to him and the person. You can say who that is since we, have, we won't spend time on introductions here. How does one cope with success and what does it take to manage a unicorn? This is Nitin Gupta. What you, are, what you have in mind as success is something which is significantly beyond where we stand right now. Uh, and to me, the big concern around coping with success is becoming complacent. Uh, I hope we are not complacent. Uh, and I hope that if we become complacent, that there are people who will come in and, and you know, uh, slap us here and there a little bit to say you, you're becoming complacent. So therefore, uh, you know, Coping with that success is is less of a concern. I think it's yes. When when it comes to you, how how does how do you not let it get to your head a little bit? Becomes a big part of it. Um, thankfully, we have very good people around us uh, who are very honest. Uh, look, every business from outside seems everything is brilliant, but there are a lot of challenges internally, right? So people who will not just give you the good news, but sit you down and say, here are the challenges that we have to go through, uh, keeps you grounded. I think most of the people, most of the entrepreneurs that you talk to, they will always remember the, the first, you know, six months or so, where, you know, where we would all be, you know, sharing an apartment, in, uh, you know, having mattresses. Our first office was a shutter, like a, like a shop. So we'd have to open the shutter and kind of go in. Like those things are real. Um, and you know that you can go back there if you don't focus. Um, and uh, therefore, those things hopefully allow you, allow success not to go to the head. I think managing a unicorn is uh, two parts to this. One is, is that just good enough? Probably not, because I think life's much bigger than this. Uh, we probably can do a lot more than what we're doing right now. So therefore, that's one part of it. The second is, um, Managing a unicorn, it is becomes large. It's, it's still a large company, so therefore, uh, what you did when you were, uh, you know, as a company, two-year-old company, versus what you do now is drastically different. One of the biggest changes, by the way, in all of this is uh, how to let go. And uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, we tend to hold things too tightly to ourselves and not easily let go and do not trust people uh, that easily because we think we can still do the best job. Uh, those are just the early days of, of doing this. And I even said that the stage, uh, if you really want to you know, make, the, make your company go really big, somewhere you've got to get your priorities of uh, people, product, and, and uh, profit right. Uh, most of the times when you begin, you, know, you have uh, investors around you, etc., who force you to, to kind of not have the same uh, priority order and therefore in order to manage a unicorn you probably need to uh, need to do that I think the second question is by Nagesh Bansal hey. um, how has Inmobi managed to stay user friendly despite being an advertising tech company look I think you know one of the one of the things that hit hit us uh, and hit me personally uh, was the fact that what we worked on people hated Right, you know, every, you go to anyone and say, yeah, I, myself, right? I hate advertising. And as soon as you're watching television, oh, I hate the ad. Like, why do ads come? And you know, that kind of hits you a little because it's like, you know, advertising is a beautiful industry. Unfortunately, in India, we haven't realized the power of advertising. If you go in the West, by the way, you will see, uh, you know, advertising has subsidized everything for consumers, everything. Unfortunately, in India, the advertising business is not large enough for things to get subsidized. 
We also realize that mobile will create enough and more monetization and because you will spend so much time that will change the way the, uh, you know, the ownership of anything, content and, you know, whatever you want to, will change because advertising can subsidize it. But advertising cannot continue to subsidize it if it is something that consumers hate. And therefore, uh, you know, we, we, as an advertising company, we took on the mantle of saying we will make consumers love advertising. And that's where we, we, we brought it out. Um, and it's not an easy change because you're rightly saying as an advertising tech company, you only take care about the efficiency of the advertiser or the publisher. We have brought the consumer into this picture and we are trying very hard to make consumers love advertising. I don't know how much we will succeed, but we have taken the initial steps. We have put down that vision of ourselves to say we will at some point of time in life, in the next few years, we'll make, let consumers or make consumers love advertising. And if we succeed in this, that's possibly the, it'll change the, you know, change the dynamics of the advertising industry. And that's what we're trying to do. Third question is from Neeraj Shetty. Hi. Uh, can you share more details about your initial struggle with MCOJ and what made you decide to pivot to Inmobi? What is that one advice that you would like to give to an early stage bootstrapped startup founder? Look, I think the struggles were many. There was not just single struggle. Uh, you know, people talked about un, you know, inability to hire people. Obviously, that was the case. Uh, you know, uh, this whole thing about failure uh, being in the mind. Um, not able to have good engineers, therefore not able to build a, build a good product. Um, you know, a bunch of those were uh, initial struggles, but the main struggle with, with MCOJ was the business model also. Uh, the business model didn't make sense. Uh, it, it, it would have been a good enough business to, uh, don't get me wrong, it, it would have been a good enough business to make some money. But it was not going to be a large enough business because somewhere in that business, we were not owning any IP. And I don't mean only tech IP. We didn't have, whether it's tech IP, some kind of consumer control, some kind of a control on the ecosystem that would have allowed us to, you know, become big. We were merely a, um, you know, an agent in between without adding much value, we were picking money. And therefore we realized if that's the business, this is not going to be a very, very large business. And therefore, you know, that day we made a massive decision for ourselves to say, whatever we'll do, hopefully, at least we'll solve a big problem. At least whatever we'll do will be, will be big. And to me, that effectively is the uh, two-point advice that I would give to any early stage bootstrap founder. Uh, one, solve a big problem. Because look, whether you solve a small problem or a big problem, the amount of effort it's gonna take, it's going to be exactly the same. So you might as well solve a big problem. The second is, I think if the business idea changes, don't worry about it because it is most probably bound to change within the 6 to 12 months multiple times. So therefore, we never bothered, we actually did bother about it at that point of time, only later on we realized it's okay to, you know, for things to pivot and, you know, all of that. But I think it's, it's pretty okay for, for, that to, uh, for that to happen. Sir? Okay. Vinay. What were some of your lowest points in your InMobi journey and how did you come out of them? Look, I think, you know, there are different kinds of, uh, uh, you know, low moments at different stages of the company. You know, phase one, and I kind of divide InMobi into four phases. So phase one is, is called the survival phase. It's, you know, when you're just doing enough to survive the, just to stay afloat, nothing fancy, nothing big. And the lowest moments points in those is, is actually what you get on a daily basis. Look, every day you think, what have, what, you know, why have I done this? I should give up right now and move away and, you know, go back to a cushy job. Uh, and so every day, four times a day, you will actually have those thoughts to say, look, I just want to give up. Within those, there will be some of those when, you know, the big ones would be when you're trying to go and uh, either get a customer or go raise money, you'll get no. And the reason why those are very, very low, and I'm not necessarily answering the lowest moment point there, because all of those moments are the first time when, as, an, as a human being, you are, you are hearing no so many times. And hearing no is not easy, right? It's not easy. Uh, 
you know, I never, I don't know whether each one of you had, I never done sales before, the, before, I, before I started. So, I never asked for money. You know, think about it, right? You, 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 you were brought up saying, don't ask for money, you know, be proud and all of that. Now you're basically going around and asking for money, right? You know, somebody give me some money. And, and the guy basically says no to you. And you know, you feel hurt. And those are the, the very, very low moments of, of because, and the, out, the, the great outcome of all of this, by the way, is, uh, you know, there is something that you leave behind. And that's your ego. So your ego is left behind at the end of this process. And therefore, the, and you don't realize this at that point of time, by the way. You only realize it once you've come out of it and spent few years, you know, forward. But that initial low phases are, are brilliant because, uh, you know, the, the, it's tragic. Those are tragic uh, moments that you go through. So the first phase, you know, that was the, that was the thing. So we moved on to the next phase, which was, you know, where you had, you know, you had some money and, you know, you knew what you were trying to do, etc. To me, the, that, in that phase, the lowest moment was when I ran out of money. And don't ask me why, but I ran out of money. And uh, that was hard because now you knew that you did something and you've run out of money and, you know, and you, you, know, as you shouldn't run out of money, uh, but you did. Um, and that was low because, you know, you knew you were going to shut down and, and what not. Uh, the third phase is where you are actually going and doing execution, right? Uh, so the first phase was survival. The second phase was, you know, let's get the business model right. Uh, in that getting the business model right, you kind of run out of money, very low for us. Somehow come out, come out of it because teams really support you. They give you money, etc., and you somehow come out of it. The third phase is when you're trying to scale. You, you figure out the business, you're saying, okay, it's all about scaling, scaling, scaling. In our case, it was building global, uh, you know, a kind of a global footprint, not yet completely global. And I think some of, in that phase, some of the uh, lowest moment probably for us was, uh, you know, you hire different people. Um, and I'm one of those who trusts people a lot. And uh, when somebody breaches that trust in, in your exec team, um, you feel hurt. Um, very, very hurt, and you know that happened. You know, somebody, um, you know, embezzled money from a little company like us, um, and uh, held us ransom. Um, you know, fraud papers were signed by because I didn't understand the language. Because you go to these different countries, I didn't understand the language, so I trusted the guy, and he said, "Why don't you sign here?" I actually, ended up, almost ended up signing the company to him. Um, I didn't know because I trusted the guy. I said, hey, I'll do it. So, you know, those, and, and it took me six months to come out of it. Like, because to solve for that, because he, he you know, he had the company. <laughs> so how do you come out of it? So, so some of those become, some of, some of those become really hard. Um, yeah. So. Do you think you ever started out with the mindset of creating a unicorn? Is it the right attitude to go after building something great? No, absolutely not. I, I don't think you can... It's, I, again, it's easily said than done. Everyone basically has a dream. Everyone of us will basically come out and say, I will build the next bit company. The problem is that uh, that has no meaning. But you soon realize that has no meaning. But that thought should be there to say, look, I will build something big. The unicorn part is good because you, that means you're aiming big. If the question was more around saying, hey, I'm going to make more money, that's not necessarily a thing. So you've got to really solve for something big. So if you solve for something really big, important, whether consumer, enterprise, software, whatever, um, that's a good way to do it. Um, building something great means that you've got to be great at that one thing. Um, and I, I have this evolving thought on this. I, you know, I used to believe I'm a very strong product person, or at least believe that I'm a strong product person. Uh, so I always thought that you know, building a great product is very important. I have, a, I have a much broader belief to say, you know, there can be companies who can say, I would be great at sales. So, but, but be amazing at it then. Be amazing and like, you know, be the host. I'll be great at marketing. So market the hell out of you. Like Oracle is a great example of being a great sales company. Is there anything wrong with that? No, it's absolutely brilliant. But it's the strength of the, the core strength needs to be really, really, really good. 
Um, Paytm, for example, is an amazing marketing company, right? Brilliant. I think it's great because they, they do a great job of marketing themselves. So they're different companies who have different strengths. Uh, and so therefore, and they're all solving a very good problem for consumers. So don't get me wrong, they're all solving. But the way they approach it has, is different. And so therefore, you can kind of figure out solving something critical for a customer, but approaching it any so you want, you know, should work. What does Inmobi think about native ad market opportunity? It's a very specific advertising question. Not sure if everybody uh, is aware of it. But I think native ad just for the context is more around the ad kind of blending into the environment of the publisher. So it's, it does, you can't see the difference between the ad and the content. Um, I think that's the only way to go because you can't have these uh, stupid banner ads flashing on your face. It makes you want to puke uh, when you look at the ad. We don't like them. Consumers don't like them. We've got to get rid of them. They are the largest still in the marketplace. So somehow moving the ecosystem into native is very important. Um, and so therefore we think it's, it's the right thing to do from a consumer point of view. And we have a massive investments on that. So we think it's the right thing to potentially do. Which market sectors do you, re do you think are really underserved today? I think education is very underserved. I think uh, safety is very underserved. I think healthcare is very underserved. I think um, FinTech is un underserved. Uh, I think GovTech is underserved, government tech. Uh, I think most of it is underserved, frankly speaking. Uh, like you don't have massive efficiencies. Like outside of e-commerce probably, uh, I think, you know, few, these very, very large, uh, like e-commerce and uh, probably, you know, the, the on-demand taxi, maybe ad tech, uh, everything in the country is inefficient and how do you make them more efficient is a brilliant, uh, like one could say, you know, there are a lot of people who went to the US in the mid, like whatever, 70s, 80s, 90s, and there were so many problems in India. We all stayed back to say, oh, there are so many problems in the yeah. India. Brilliant, <laughs> we'll solve for them, right? That's, that's, you know, that's the, yeah, you just have to figure that out. So I think there are a lot of sectors. You, you, I don't think the ARP challenge is sectors right now. Uh, our challenge is to pick any one problem, solve it rightly, deeply, execute on it. Uh, I think the problem probably is that a lot of the people do not pick big enough problems. They end up picking small problems and therefore then they get into this convoluted cycle of not getting rightly funded, not getting, uh, you know, and then not seeing success and, you know, whatever. So you got to pick a more fundamental problem uh, and solve for it rightly and then you'll see everything come together. Do education, educational qualifications of a founder matter more than the product idea? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't think the two questions are, the, the two things are even related. Uh, I don't know the context in which the question is asked. Probably in the context of um, is the, if somebody has a great product idea, doesn't have a great education background, will he get funded? Probably that seems to be the question. Versus somebody has a great educational background, not a great product idea, will he get funded? <laughs> I think the second is certainly not happening. Like you have a great, there are a lot of people with great educational background, so that, that is certainly out of the picture. Uh, if you have a great product idea, don't have good educational qualifications. Um, I think the country still values that a lot. Uh, whether you like it or not, there is a bias towards uh, education and therefore they, uh, and when I say they, it's the more the investors, they kind of tend to look at and value that somewhat. Uh, so yeah, it does, it does have a role in, um, I think, in the world today right now. Um, even in the US, by the way, in reality, um, I don't think the society has reached a level where uh, they can look at the individual for what, what that individual is. Uh, they have to use some frameworks to understand who that individual is. And education is one criteria, but that is not necessarily means that you you are successful. Um, 
I think, you know, we as, at Inmobi, we love to hire failed entrepreneurs uh, because we think some, you know, for people who have tried these things, failures are great. Um, but I think in general, education qual qualifications has a certain value, but I don't think it's higher than the product idea. If you had to start your entrepreneurial journey today, what will you build and why, Neeti? You know, I could try to build roads, but uh, <laughs> it's a good business in India right now. Uh, given I don't have that much capital, wouldn't have that much capital to build roads. I think, I think something in the, uh, probably in the education space, I, I think it's a very underserved market. Uh, India pays a lot for education. Uh, everybody wants to get educated. Um, it's a ticket for freedom, ticket for success, ticket for safety. Uh, it has, if, it, if, the, uh, if the market goes up, people pay more for education. If the market goes down, people pay more for education. So it's an evergreen field. So I think education is an interesting one. But having said that, there are so many startups in the education field. Um, wouldn't mind having one more there. Um, yeah. Cool, I'm done. <laughs>